This episode is sponsored by the online Chopwave course, which is powered by the Physical Whip Academy. Now at Physical Whip, we are really passionate about educating our clients into how to use the technology. And that is why we've devised the online Shockwave course. So if you're looking at implementing this technology into your clinic, you're unsure of how to do so, the course is going to provide you with bite-sized educational pieces on how to implement it, how to get your team upskilled, what to use it for, different indications. So check that out. And we really thank the Physical Group Academy and the online Shockwave course for sponsoring the podcast. AI, artificial intelligence, everyone is talking about it at the moment. It's something which I'm really interested in. I got in Rob Dixon, who is CEO and co-founder of Dixon Humphreys, which is a firm based in Manchester, who specialise in AI training and education. We had a great chat. We talked about everything from how it's impacting healthcare, as well as just the wider community and where it can lead in the future. So it's something which I'm really interested in, and I hope you enjoy the podcast. Rob, great to see you. Good to see you, Andy. So I saw you speak recently in my Vistage group. It was an absolutely fascinating, slightly overwhelming, slightly, uh, eye- well, massively eye-opening, but really, really great in, in, in the information that we got out from it. So it was all about AI and basically we're on the cusp of something absolutely huge and it's already here. Yeah. So I appreciate you coming in and talking to us about it today. No problems. So just in terms of, for you then, how did you get involved in in setting up your company? Yeah, well, quite an interesting story. So uh, I've always been a bit of an entrepreneur at heart. Um, I actually started a joinery business a long time ago. I I worked a bit in in corporate and commercial. And along the various years, I ended up uh, as an associate lecturer uh, at uh, a a university in Manchester. I I won't mention the name. Um, And... As time went by, uh, I'd associate lectured for about 10 years and eventually I, I became a full-time lecturer. I did this for two years. I used to lecture on, uh, I still do it in fact, uh, part-time uh, on strategic management, uh, leading change on the MBA, the global MBA program. So because of this, I was always really interested in the external environment uh, and, and by that think, think pestle, political, economic, social, technological, environmental, legal, and how these changes in that environment affected business strategy and how organizations used, innovated around this and built from there. In particular, I particularly was interested in technology. And through this interest, I kind of got into Elon Musk uh, because every Elon Musk company is very innovative and they're all built around taking some new technology and disrupting some industry with that technology. Now, OpenAI was actually founded by Elon Musk a long time ago, back in 2015. Uh, Elon Musk, uh, Ilya Greg Brockman, and uh, somebody else whose name, who uh, slightly forgets me, the four of them originally founded it up as a, as a counterbalance to, to Google. Uh, so I'd kind of been following it for, for a while. And in the 30th of November, 2022, uh, they launched ChatGPT. 3.5. Now, I'd seen a few videos of ChatGPT2, uh, which, sorry, GPT2, which was kind of on YouTube with people sort of little demos of it from what I'd seen, which looked amazing. But there's nothing quite beats actually asking something to write a poem and suddenly it does it in Wordsworth or you ask it to summarize a document and it can do it and you can ask it to write the lyrics to a song and how is it doing this? It's quite transformative. And for me, I I can remember it quite distinctly. It was sort of that Christmas break, 2022-23, and I was filling around on the computer, and ChatGPT was always popping up in my feed, you know, download this, download this, this is great, this is great in Twitter and X and things. And I eventually downloaded it, and wow. I probably spent two days doing nothing but watch YouTube videos to work out how is this thing doing what it's doing. And then I had a really interesting moment, which... uh, for me was my own personal chat GPT moment where I suddenly thought, wow, this is a transformative technology that is going to change the world. And right now, there's probably a tiny percentage of people, probably less than 1% of the world, are aware of this. And I thought to myself, what am I going to do about this? What am I going to do with this knowledge? Uh, and I thought, well, you only live once, I'm going to do something with it. And I set about set, uh, organizing uh, a big no-code hackathon at my university. 
uh, we kind of got about a thousand people coming from all around the world, various different places. I've been building all this up, trying to get hold of people to do it. And to cut a long story short, the university uh, it got a little bit big and I sort of talked to some of the higher up people and they were like, what's this event? How many people are coming? What, the whole business school? Um, this might promote plagiarism and they cancelled it. Uh, I was rather perturbed by this, to say the least. And I thought, do you know what? I'm going to leave. I'm still going to lecture part-time because I love lecturing, I love educating, and I love my uh, people I work with at the university. But uh, I'm going to start a company, and I started my co-founder, Dylan Dixon Humphreys, uh, to basically find companies who wanted to upskill and be part of this AI revolution. And we've been working with them uh, ever since. Right. Yeah, no, it, it's amazing Like what, what you've done in that time period. And that just if we take it back to basics, like what is AI? So... What is AI is a great question. There's a lot of different terms. AGI, there's now artificial superintelligence, there's uh, retrieval AI, uh, machine learning, all these things. Let's keep it simple. And let's look from a business point of view and not get too technical with these things. I just want to talk about the difference between generative AI and retrieval AI. Now, retrieval AI is kind of a term that didn't really exist until generative AI turned up and came along. Uh, it's the term we didn't know we needed until we discovered something new. Retrieval AI is all about data. It's looking up data, retrieving data, indexing data, using data to answer questions. So that's retrieval AI. The AI bit is just how clever the algorithm is that does stuff with the data. But the thing about retrieval AI, there's data there's usually lots of it. It's grabbing stuff, it's doing stuff, it's doing some kind of little algorithm -y thing and popping stuff out the other end. That's retrieval AI. Now, generative AI is the new thing that you can do with data. And the transformative thing here came about in a paper in 2017 called Attention is All You Need, which was about the transformer. People found they could train generative AI models. Now, generative AI, you take the same blob of data, you train a model with it, and now you prompt it, and it gives a response. So it's prompt, response, prompt, response. But there's actually no data in the model when it's deployed. So pre, we can kind of roughly summarize the world as pre 30th of November 2022, i.e. before ChatGPT and post ChatGPT. This is oversimplifying, but I think that's all we need as business people. Pre 30th of November 2022, the world was a retrieval AI world. People did lots of things with data. That's for how computers worked. Post the 30th of November 2022, there is two things that you can do with data now. There's the old retrieval AI way, looking up algorithms, coding, indexing. And there's the generative AI way. You take that blob of data, you train a model over a period of time, you deploy the model, and then you are effectively working with the knowledge inferred from that data in the deployed model, and you go prompt, response, prompt, response. And the famous ones are language models like ChatGPT, where you're prompting with some words, you get some words back, but it doesn't have to be that. It could be a video model, it could be an image model, there's, a weather, there's weather models, there's alpha fold, there's protein structures, it could be uh, images, diagrams, uh, x-rays you name it you it's a prompt response prompt response basis so let me again i don't know if i've got this right exactly here but if you is it like saying giving someone a library you've got a library which is maybe retrieval where you're going to get data but it's someone reading generative is where someone reads the whole library and then they've created their own knowledge you were paying attention in uh, the session you came to see <laughs> yes that's a that's a great example so let's Go with the librarian example. So a retrieval AI uh, library is a library that we all kind of know. You go to the library, you ask a question, the librarian heads off to the books, using their index system, retrieves the books that are relevant to answer their question, and they bring them back to you. The books, the data, the librarian retrieves the books, they bring them back, answers your question. There you go. Retrieval AI library. The generative AI library would be we get the librarian, they read all of the books in the library, they've got a good memory, they're a quick reader, so they've read everything, they've got all of that, and now we pick them up 
and we put them in a different spot and we basically lock them in a room, close all the doors, shut them off from the world, and we knock on that door and we give them a prompt and they give us a response. So in language, what's an example? If I said to you for uh, something like, uh, for your birthday, I baked you a cake. Okay, I gave you the prompt, you gave me the response. Uh, I could also say, write me a 3,000 word essay on the impact of Brexit in the UK. Okay. Yeah, so that's another prompt. The response here is quite difficult for a human to deliver. Yeah, the cake one's easy. The 3,000 word essay harder. But if I locked you in a room and forced you to write that, you could eventually write a 3,000 word essay. And you'd be doing that, you know, from all the knowledge you've got within your brain. Now, this librarian that we've locked in our generative high room, we can knock on the door for your birthday. I baked you a librarian says cake. But we could also knock on the door and say, write me a 3,000 word essay on the impact of Brexit in the UK. And the Genetify librarian could hand us out a 3,000 word essay. How is the librarian able to write that essay? Because they haven't got access to any data, they haven't got any books. They can write the essay because they read all the books in the library. So they've got that knowledge, therefore they can write the essay. And that's the generative AI library, as it were. So let, let's just surmise for, for a moment, because it's, it's a bit of a difficult thing to, to, to get your head around. Retrieval AI, there's lots of data. Generative AI, there's no data. You use data to train a model, and that model, there is no data in it. Two different things to do. So is that why if you were in chat GPT and you ask it a question and it gives you an answer and then you were to say, give me a different answer, it can come up with something which is equally correct, so to speak, but it's, it's, it is different. Yes, because it's not looking things up. It's not going off to get some notes or finding the answer. It is generating the answer in response to a prompt. So imagine that was a librarian and we asked it a question today and then we asked the librarian a question tomorrow. Well, it's going to be different every time. Just like even though you know, we're, we're, we're all experts in our own domains and if we're asked questions about our area of expertise, it's always a slightly different answer, but it is grounded in our, in our training data, our own area of expertise and, and, and experience. But it is different because we're generating it every time. We're not remembering it. We're not looking it up. So if you move to a couple of examples, so good friend of mine, radiologist, Dr. Mm -hmm. Shunk Basu. So he's working on a project currently where they're, they're involved in imaging and they're looking at, um, from, in terms of scans, looking for fractures so that they can have something where they don't need to have the senior radiologist. It can be someone maybe not as senior, but they can still predict if someone's got a fracture or they can say if someone's got a fracture. So how, how does something like that, how does that work in this generative model? So to give you an idea of the generative, so there's lots of data there and you know exactly what data we collect and what data is available is going, 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 to, going to vary from case to case. But the, the current way is people are looking things up, they're looking at research, they're perhaps looking at published, um, uh, published research on what different things are in turn, people are trained, people are looking at it. Let's just consider the generative AI version of a radiologist for a moment. So first of all, we need a training data set to train our generative AI model. What we ideally want is something like an x-ray of a person uh, at the beginning. Uh, and then we want our kind of output. That's going to be our prompt, an x-ray. And we want our output is perhaps an annotated x-ray showing uh, where the fracture is with some notes on what the fracture is. Or maybe it's highlighting a certain area with a little arrow showing where the fracture is. OK, so we want to collect lots and lots and lots of those examples. X-ray with an annotated X-ray, X-ray with an annotated X-ray. Now imagine we've got 10,000 of them, maybe we've got 100,000 of them, maybe we've got a million of them. We train our model to guess the output from the prompted input. Because we've already given it the data, it, it can run through that guessing process. And eventually we have our nice generative AI model and we can deploy it. And what our new model will work like is, we give it the prompt of an X-ray and its response will be an outputted x-ray with annotation on it saying what's wrong. Now, the beauty of this is, one, it's instant. Two, it effectively de-skills that entire process. Three, so long as you're 
the more and more data you put into it, the better it gets. If ever it's wrong and someone changes it, that's update and train it. And we can make a, a version two of the model, version three of the model. We, we can keep iterating it uh, backwards and forwards. But the other thing that's possible is probably all of this data to make that model is already lying around in hospitals, you know, ar around the NHS or, or the world. And we just need to find a big pile of x-rays and annotated x-rays and get them into some kind of standardized format. And then we could use all that historical data to build our radiography model and prompt response, prompt response. And if someone isn't doing that already in the world, I would be amazed because it's a very obvious use case. Now, what, what does a radiologist do when this generative AI is built into the X-ray machine? And you do an X-ray and it gives you the X-ray and it gives you the annotated report to the X-ray. Um, and you know, maybe you could even get it to also suggest the treatment for that or what should be the next and, and do the assessment because you can just carry on this process of prompt response in how you treat some of these diff uh, different things. The answer is uh, nobody knows yet, but one thing's for sure, it's going to be different to what they currently do today. And I guess that's in any role. I think I remember when, when you were in the um, presentation to us, you we, you looked at, I think it was the Goldman Sachs article where mm -hmm. 50, is it 50 percent of the legal profession is being forecast to maybe being changed or so, so something like that, wasn't it? It was about 40 to 50 percent less headcount could deliver the same output in, in law. It, that was in the US and Europe, and I think they produced that about 2023, March. It was a Gold, Goldman Sachs article. And yes, uh, a lot of what lawyers are doing is uh, they love uh, bundling up, uh, you know, witness statements, uh, reference, uh, defense, critique, expert witnesses, uh, contracts, so on and so forth. It's all heavily worded documents. These things are getting passed backwards and forwards with different versions. People are drafting them, writing them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is the sort of stuff that a uh, a large language models such as ChatGPT 4.0, although for that one, I think Claude Opus is probably better, which is an anthropic uh, language model, uh, can, can handle uh, really well. The generic ones today, helping them rewrite and redraft. And we've slightly uh, moved off our generative eye retrieval AI, but that, what we were talking about before is the, the general principle. If we made if we'd done that generative eye and made a large language model, such as we, we could have done, such as ChatGPT is, we'll have something that can read and draft contracts and respond, respond to it. We could, though, go one step further and have one that was specialized on something like doing patent applications, where there's a huge tra training data set of what information do you require to output a patent application? And then how do you submit a court form to appeal a patent application, and you could build specialized models that do those, those sorts of things as well. And the general stuff can already have a big impact, but right now people will be building out uh, specific tools. I think in, in law, I think it's Harvey is uh, one of the law ones that's doing that, and the, the, there's the whole stack of patent pals, another one. There's all, all sorts of new startups in the area building extra dialed in models to work on top of that. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it is really interesting. And like going back to the, the radiology uh, example that we were talking about before. So I'm intrigued to know like what is the general response to, to when you're talking about this? Because I'm sure mm -hmm. that a lot of people will be like, well, you can't replace what I do. Yeah, mm -hmm. you might be able to replace lawyers, but you can't replace, I'm a medical professional. So I mean, I, I ask that as one question. Um, and then just whilst I think of it as well, like you talk about models, how do you create a model? Like how, if you could start with that one first, like you say, we create a model and we put that in. How, how, did, how is that done with images? Like what, what, what do you mean by a model? So um, training a specific model, like in that radiography example, is really not for, at the moment, it is not for non-technical people to do. You're looking for kind of an AI engineer, an AI trainer, and you're doing something at the cutting edge of research. But in essence, they're going to gather a, a data, a training data set that is inputs and outputs historically. And you're generally looking at thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not millions of these instances. And then you are taking a model uh, that is basically, let's call it, let's say, 
it's got like 100 billion parameters and they're all these settings are set to zero and you're going to chuck this data in and you're going to get the model to try and guess the correct diagnosis for that radiologist as per the output you've given it and it's just going to brute force trial and error it and eventually it'll get lucky and maybe effort number you know 90 billion 452 go it gets it right and oh brilliant then we dial those settings in and we move on to the next piece of the training data so this training can take quite a long time it uses a lot of energy it uses a lot of compute but you just set that's why everybody wants nvidia gpus that's why taiwan's quite strategically important that's why nvidia shares are sh shooting through the, through the roof uh, that's why there's uh, predicted quite an energy uh, crisis come up in the US because it's predicted that all these GPUs will use about 25% of the US's uh, energy within a few years. If just the current order one will be there, and it's all this model training that, 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 that's, that's kind, of, kind of going on. It's quite technical. Um, and once you've done that, we end up with a model where we're going to put it in and it'll, it'll correctly predict everything in its training data. And therefore, you can now take the new X-ray, put it in, and the chances are it got it right for the, the 100,000 examples you gave it. It's a very good chance it'll be right for the 100,000 and once one that you now, you now try, 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 try with it um, next. So that's how you do it. I wouldn't particularly say it's something other than experts will do at the moment, but I suspect it's not that far away that it's, it's going to be within a year or two i don't think it's going to be that difficult for us to start to try and train these things just as easily as we use something like an excel sheet mm. um i think it'll almost become an inbuilt function with the way we work you know in a database you'll be like oh let's set it up like this or oh, let's train a model from it and it'll, it'll just kind of build you a little model that you know from your from your prompt and, um, um, and response um what do we need to know now though what we need to know now is just recognizing that with something like those x-rays there is this new thing called training a model with inputs and outputs prompt response recognizing that data is there recognizing this is something we, you know we could do with so uh let's think of a few other examples you know mri scans is a really obvious one mri scan in mri scan out with the cancer draw, drawn on it there might be things like, uh, let's say you had, um, you know, all this biometric health monitoring stuff where it's monitoring your heart rate, uh, you walk it, you're walking, uh, you're sleeping, all this sort of stuff. Let's say you had all of that data and it could predict, you know, are you, let's say, getting healthier or getting more healthier, getting less healthy? Uh, maybe you're ill. Maybe you are seriously ill and need to see a doctor. You know, you can probably go through people's you know, biometric uh, data sets and then see the, the, the find the people who went to the, the GP. That's a training data set and find out what was wrong with them. And then it could be saying you have probably got COVID, you've probably got an injury, you, you seem to have some lung problem, you know, go to the doctor. And it could be predicting that before you even realize it yourself because there's a set of data there and there's a kind of an output uh, going on. And you could go through all of the different types of, uh, uh, what's another, another medical device example might be uh, the material you're going to use for something, let's say, like an implant. So uh, what you want is to choose the right material for the patient. Um, and apologies, I'm by no means an expert on this, but the training data would be something like uh, the DNA of the patient, a tissue sample, whatever, the the prognosis is that's your input data the prompt and what you want as an output prompt is the different materials that the implant's going to be with a probability of rejection and you just say okay we need a replacement hand <laughs> do i want a metal one do i want a, a graphene one or whatever and it, it says oh this is the optimum one for this patient how would you get that there'll be loads of published research on that data you can take that, you can train it, you can build a model, and suddenly input, output, input, output. All of these are existing blobs of data where there's suddenly a new way of doing things that will be better and more enhanced and very de-skilling in these particular uh, areas and fields. Yeah, if I give you another example then, so we work with force plates so and dynamometry, so basically assessing force, so mm -hmm. whether it's from balance, jump, 
push pull. Yeah. So it's it's a relatively new, I would say, that people are embracing more data. So it's physio, I think, has been a little bit behind in terms of having proper objectivity. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows data is helpful now. It seems to be widely accepted. So in terms of gathering data, it's going to be very easy now, and it already is very easy to gather significant amount of data yeah, yeah. from a patient in a matter of seconds. So it, in terms of that, I would assume that that would be quite an easy, you could just build a population, build a data set very quickly and easily, even for one person and do it individualized, but then also from a, a a bigger population of, of people as well and, and build a model that way. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you, 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 let's say we were trying to, uh, how quickly can you get recovery? How quickly can you be peak, build peak performance in an athlete? There's all kinds of different inputs that you could be having in there, what they're lifting, what they're pushing, what exercises, duration, number of reps, how long they, did, they, did they drink before, what did they eat, their DNA, all kinds of, inputs and then somewhere you want to be able to measure the success of that what what, what is the output of that um uh and you know you might be measuring let, let's say that they're going to do this routine for like a week and then you know what, what's the measurement afterwards and if you could build that training data set up or there was an established training data set of that somewhere because people are recording these things with professional athletes you can use that to train a model and then you can start to use that to predict what is the optimum you know, gym workout, weight workout, pattern workout, diet, and, and build these th these things things to things together. And because it's generative, it's going to be able to respond to every situation and every circumstance. The first version, who knows how well it works? But as you get dialed in, you're going to be getting more and more training data to build version two, version three, and eventually you're going to end up with something that. It's highly personalized and, and highly effective. Uh, with these sort of uh, cutting edge things, uh, it's best start simple. Uh, you know, try and just don't have all the variables. Start one, build up, get something that works there. Um, the uh, you know, and, and and then expand out with 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 uh, with, with different uh, vari variables. From from a diet perspective, I always find one about uh, you know the idea of um, uh, what's the thing as well? Uh, insulin resistance uh, mixed in with uh, you know are you how you react to insulin versus perhaps your current a few current measurements BMI uh, DNA things like that and just seeing how you respond to different types of of diets and if you there must be controls of all this stuff and research studies of all these things and you want to get a model that you put in your biometrics your insulin uh, response your current DNA and all this stuff and it tells you this is the diet. That would be best for you, uh, and you know you could be following that, and you can build build out from there. And you know, looking forward to these things. There's got to be people working on them. It's but just, right now. There's a lot of things out there. So like I've got Zoe, you know, the Zoe app, mm -hmm. which you've done that. I've not done it yet. I need to get around to doing that one. I've got my Fitness Pal, I think it's called, mm -hmm. where you're inputting what you're consuming. I'll monitor what I do in the gym. So. There's actually a significant amount. I've got my Apple Watch. That I'm, so I'm yeah, gathering yeah. all of this stuff all the time. We're getting it, all that data. It's yeah. massive amount of data just on me, mm -hmm. on a regular my sleep. All of that is monitored. So you, all of that could easily be pulled into something. Uh, well, I say easily. It's the, the, There will be something Potentially. There. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There's all of that data currently can be used to do retrieval AI things. So on my little Google Fitness app, it's telling me, you know, my average average weight, how many steps I've done, it ranks how fit I am, and maybe it gives me a few little videos to motivate me here and there, et cetera, et cetera. But they're all algorithm-based. They're taking that data, they're doing some kind of calculations, and that's causing it to suggest things. What we're really wanting is to be training some sort of model that can be prompted and, and response, prompt response from that from that data. So we're not talking language here. We might be talking about uh, you know how much water should should I be drinking in a particular week, or how what is the optimum frequency of exercise versus sleep recovery? Where you've got those ones that uh, you know measure how much you sleep and things, and it should be saying tonight you should sleep five hours, tonight you should sleep six. Not from a calculation but from a training data set of what actually resulted in recovery. And they, that would be 
better and more accurate than the other, the other things. So those kind of businesses uh, and devices that are collecting that data, what is vitally important for those organizations is to be working out what is the generative AI version of their current business model and how does that go? Because the generative AI way of doing things is going to be vastly superior. And if they don't pivot, they are going to be heavily disrupted by competitors who do build a generative AI way, way to go. And I think this is quite important for professionals in this, this kind of space, in this medical device space, is being able to work out which organizations, which devices, um, uh, which companies are taking this approach to move on to the new way of doing things with that data. Because that's, that's the space to be in. That's going to be the disruption within the industry. That's where it needs to go. And you've just got to have that basic understanding of data, two things to do. OK, what's this device doing? Is it a retrieval AI device? Is, it, is retrieval AI being used to the data collected from this advice? Or is it generative AI? being used from the data collector from this device. What's the policy? What's the shift? How's, the, how's that going? And asking those questions and understanding it at that extra uh, level up. Yeah, I mean, that, that would make a massive impact. I think with diagnostic ultrasound, which is a massive exploding area in MS case in sports medicine, but it's still quite a, um, it's a gray area in terms of who can use it, what you can report on. Whereas yeah. If you had access to it where you're scanning and it's, it's, it's got its own data source and it's saying actually that could be a tumor for example or something yeah. like that that's then huge because it almost takes the the, the the responsibility or put maybe less responsibility on the the clinician because yeah. it's, it's being more yeah. agnostic and it's saying look this is based on that, that generative AI I, I actually feel uh, as I've been sort of working with this over the last year and coming across different things things like a GP's appointment. I'm, I'm actually almost slightly frustrated that we the idea of a GP's appointment is the technology is so there that the GP's appointment is almost obs obsolete in, in so many ways. Because what, what are they doing? They're asking you some, some stuff. Maybe they take a couple of tests. They can't do that much. And they've got 10 minutes to analyze your medical history, do some stuff, work out what's doing, make a diagnosis, give you some treatment, off you go. And then that's it. You're then left on your own. Whereas if we had a sort of, you know, what's going on then? There's a kind of an input and an output. There's a prompt response. Now, there's all of that data set of all of these different things. And when you added in people's weight, phone, DNI, biometrics, all the monitoring thing is, you could have basically a GP permanently on your phone uh, just monitoring everything and you could say uh, I've got this wrong with me I've got that wrong with me and it would say oh uh, let's take a picture of your eyes and it could you know monitor your iris uh, wait um, ask you a few questions you chat with it take your temperature feed that in has a look at your biometrics and it might say oh don't worry it's just a virus don't do this or such and such a thing maybe you need to go to the doctor because you're going to need to get a prescription or why don't you try this at the pharmacist or it could say see how you feel let's check back in an hour and then an hour later, a little buzz, what happened? How, how are you doing? Oh, yeah, don't, don't worry about it, etc. So it's like having one permanently there, and, but it would have access to all of the knowledge, all of the latest medical research, all of the latest data, all of the information, all of the pharmaceutical manuals, your entire patient history, and all of the metrics that are there at the same time. And you could just pretty much automate the whole GP uh, process. It would be amazing. And it would free up so much resource for the people who did have something seriously wrong mm. and needed more than just a bit of a reassurance and signposting because we could be using those doctors then to, to do the things where we do need those, uh, those serious involvements. And these are the kind of bolder projects it would be nice to see happening, especially in thing, things like, uh, you know, in the NHS because, you know, there's a lot of crisis, a lot of issues there. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how these things come across. Connecting that back to the question you said earlier about how do people react to this, I, I bounced that idea off a few GPs, uh, the, few, the earlier one off a few radiologists. Um, and uh, to say the least, they're not 
they're not particularly thrilled by the uh, the idea of this thought. I've also ba bounced the the legal ones off barristers. Um, but as time moves along, it's starting to become more and more obvious that this is going to be significantly better. It's going to be quicker, cheaper, better, save lives, more efficient, more more there. And I think this moves us into this world of the unknown. And fundamentally, there's a lot of fear within people, uh, experts in these fields, of, of what happens in this new world where the computer can do their job, the AI can do their job. And I think, you know, some of that is justified, but also uh, I think it's also quite exciting. It's quite empowering because whatever it is going to be, it's going to be progress. It's going to be new. It's going to be innovative. It's going to advance society. And instead of being scared of these things, you know, it's still very early days in the field. I think those who embrace it, upskill and start exploring this, they're going to be creating this new world. They're going to be working out what the new radiologist does. Now the actual diagnosis, what happens next? How do we actually make these patients better? The GPs, rather than focusing on appointments and those things, will start to look at how do we actually improve the health, the lifespan, the longevity of our people. That, you know, we can get back to the purpose. We can get all of this time back from these models. And the practitioners and the experts who are embracing this and moving forward with it, they're going to have the agency and the control to, to, build, to build this new world. So yeah, it can feel a bit, a bit scary, but nobody knows how this stuff's going on. It, it's going to be quite exciting. Uh, there's lots of opportunity and it, it's kind of inevitable. So upskill, get involved, find out where it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be an adventure. It's definitely going to be change. I think uh, standing still, ignoring it, hoping it will go away, it, it, it's, it's just not going to be an option. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a really good point. Uh, and then just touching as well, we've talked a lot about some of the technical things within healthcare, but just gen general things like one of the things that our clients are using in private practices, they'll be using patient notes, AI for that. And it was with a practice recently where they mm. just said it's been so great. Like no one really likes taking notes. There's not many people mm -hmm. enjoy doing that. And say the physios in this instance, they just have something recording in the background, automatically uploads their patient notes, gives them a summary and it helps them do that. Like what other things out there from a more just business operations and administrative perspective should people be aware of and considered? And that doesn't even need to be from a healthcare perspective. Yeah. So, I mean, you've got things like InVideo, that is great. That's a text to video generation tool. It uses stock videos. You can just paste in a product or a service and it will just generate a video for you, narrate it, put it all together, script it, and then you can click edit, upload your pictures in there. There's a great tool, presentations.ai. When you onboard it, it will scrape your company's website, take all your color scheme, your profiling, find out bits of information about your company, and then you could ask it to do a presentation about uh, some products, you know, your product or your company in general, and it puts some really beautiful graphically designed slides together, you with some lovely transitions. Um, and so on and so forth. There's a great uh, bot called Get Cody where you can sort of take things like this is great for um, let's say you've got a lot of documentation to do with something. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of a uh, let, let's say you've got something like uh, a legal case and you want to bring all of these legal documents, you know, letters, correspondence, uh, submissions, courts, witness statements. You could put them all into Get Cody. And uh, very easy to use. It's like a little bot. You give it a, a prompt to tell it how you want it to behave, creative, factual, and assistant. You, you, you connect it to a model, like ChatGPT 4.0 or 4.0 mini. And then you're suddenly it's like chatting with ChatGPT, but it's got access to everything in the case as well. So you can now say, write me a letter, write me an application, or uh, could you produce a summary of the case, or give me a list of all the documents in the case with the key points in each one. Now we've done that, could you write a reply to this particular letter based on this witness report that's come in, come in here, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so forth. Or we've just received this correspondence in, in can you draft me a reply and write it out? And, and now it's doing it within the context of all of that material. 
So I've seen people do this for HR. I've seen them doing it for pitching, for quote quoting, where you put the company's information in there. That can be really, really, really powerful to use. Um, we've got things like uh, Mid Journey 6 for doing really detailed image generation. We've got things like Runway 3 for doing text to video creation. Uh, but if there's something that, that a place to get started and you want to do things professionally, I personally would recommend the paid ChatGPT account. Uh, start there, you've got access to pretty much all the latest models. It's very easy to use. You've got threads, you can customize it. But also within ChatGPT, on the paid version, you have these things called GPTs. And these GPTs are connecting that model to all of those kind of applications that I talked about. So you can be chatting away with it and you can connect into Canva, you can connect into um, in video and you can be creating videos, LinkedIn's, Zapier's out from it. Actually, while we're talking about uh, um, in the medical field for a moment, there's one particular app um, and one particular GPT called Consensus uh, AI, which is a GPT you can use within the paid chat GPT. What this is, is uh, basically, if you think of something like a university library with millions of academic peer-reviewed public published journals in there, it's like a full index of all of that in kind of a, you know, electronic format. And it's like asking ChatGPT a question. So you could say something like, here's my patient notes. Um, can you go and have a look at all the current medical research and find any academic papers that are relevant to this diagnosis that I've given from these, these patient notes? And from that, it rips off to the consensus.ai, searches for all the medical journals that relate to what your diagnosis is, grabs them, brings them back, and you can get it to produce a little list, you can get it to write suggestions, you can get it to do why, and you can kind of bring into your conversation all of the latest research that, that's in that consensus area. So, uh, yeah, in terms of that example where we just talked about where it, yeah, the physio is taking the notes and it writes it up, oh, that's probably a, a piece of software written for physios and you do it, it tick, ticks boxes. But let's say we wanted to explore further on how we can deal with this particular patient. We could be, if we put that into paid chat GPT and did that consensus search, we could be then connecting in with all of this paywall data as well, which is the published medical research, et cetera. And we could be bringing, bringing that into it as well. So there's a few simple apps to start having a look at, but certainly I would, uh, the paid one, explored paid chat GPT, explore some of those um, pay, paid apps, uh, sorry, the GPTs within it, and go and have a look at some TikTok videos. Uh, I like TikTok in this area the best. Just search for kind of chat GPT. How do I use chat GPT to do this? How do you use chat GPT to do that? You'll find loads of people posting little examples and it will get what you're using it for. If you're using it for physio, you'll find there'll be people using it for physio. If you're using it as a doctor, you'll find it as people as a doctor. If you're using it to do, uh, you know, mail shot or marketing, you'll find people doing that. And eventually your feed will fill up with the relevant people and you'll probably find someone in your space constantly exploring this stuff so that would be my they, they would be my tips yeah no, well, that, that, yeah that TikTok. i know caitlin uh, mm. she, she will she will enjoy doing that one for sure so, funny side point on TikTok. if you want to see the example of the power of generative ai versus retrieval ai think instagram think TikTok. instagram algorithm I don't know if it still is, but it used to be. It, it was a basically a retrieval AI algorithm, so not quite as addictive. Uh, same with YouTube, not quite as addictive, those YouTube shorts. The TikTok one is a generative AI algorithm. It, everything you are doing on it is learning and it's modeling you and it's predicting what you want to see. And it does it so well, it makes it highly addictive. So it's the generative AI version of hacking your dopamine system as opposed to the retrieval AI version of hacking your dopamine system, which is why TikTok is the kind of crack cocaine of social, social media. Whereas, uh, yeah, um, Instagram and YouTube are perhaps a, a milder, a milder version of that. So although I suggested TikTok there, I would say use it with care. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I have got an account, but I don't use it much. But I don't know whether I do or I don't after that. Maybe I think I'll actually yeah. do. Be, be, be careful. Maybe never start. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, how would you recommend it? Like, it's, it's such a huge topic, and I think you've articulated it really well today. But uh, how would you recommend people to... They've done TikTok, but they want to get a bit more in-depth knowledge yeah, so a good thing to do would be to you know start start with a bit of course. Um, the, there's there's quite a few out there. At Dixon Humphreys, we we actually do an introductory course, AI literacy level zero for professionals, which is a little three week course. We do it we do all of them in person, so it's three hours online, but it's a live one hour session talking some of the basics of prompt engineering, how to use how to use it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we then have a one hour practical session where there's all sort of people that we're working with in different organizations coming together, doing little projects and trying different things. The idea is there is, let's say we were trying to build something that was going to write something or, or, or let's say we were that consensus thing that I just talked about. We were trying to get our patient diagnosis and we wanted to compare that to medical research. I'm trying to build a prompt that does this. How do I do it? That's the sort of thing you bring to the practical session and someone will go, oh yeah, you just use this, you do that, oh great, and then off you go again. So that's a kind of a, an online practical session. And the third element is a kind of a little project that we give people to work on. We do that over three weeks. No, no prior experience and that just eases people in via a little bit of a supported way to help get getting them on the journey. Once you're through the first little Phase, you've got a few apps, you've got a bit of the basics of what it is and how to use it, it, it you know, it, 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 can, uh, it can build out from there. So, the, you know, I'm sure there are other courses around, but, you know, uh, that, that's, that's what we, we do. And that's sort of been the product. I guess I'd say that course has come from, we, we've worked with the seven of us in the organization now, and we've worked with probably over 70 businesses and universities, Chinese University of Hong Kong, University, Newcastle University Business School, uh, Hearst Accountants, all kinds of businesses, universities. Uh, probably done 250 hours of in-person training, uh, at like live events and X amount of these on online events and training. And it's taken a little while to work out what people need. And uh, that level zero is, I would say, is aimed at somebody who's not particularly digitally literate they're a busy professional person but they just want to get started in how do i just what should i be doing how do i use these basic things so just a bit of confidence to to, to start the, the, the journey off and then we do a level one level two but often after that point once you've got a use case you, you know you just build yourself out because you know once you're using these things you tend to discover it and you, you find it from, from, from where you go now the other tip I would give is find a use case outside of your professional life and I think you can have a lot of fun uh, creating uh, stories to read children so I wrote a little prompt called bedtime story creator um, which uh, basically gets the AI to ask you some questions of how to write a bedtime story and you, you, you fill it in and it's all personalized and you get a personalized bedtime story for your child I've been reading this to my son. We do it with a lot of our clients, people who are finding it difficult to find a use case. And you start creating different stories, different characters, changing them, varieting them, writing poems from them, all sorts of stuff. And it, it's fun. It's fun to learn these things with your children as well. They'll start pushing buttons and it just gets into your life. What are you doing? You're learning prompt engineering. What's prompt engineering? It's how to get the AI to do the purpose that you're bringing to it, bringing your purpose to the AI. So you can do that to create a bedtime story. You can use it to diagnose a patient. Uh, it's the same skill set. It's a transferable skill. So find a fun thing outside of work to play with would be one option. Option two, find a course and you know, be, be guided uh, through it. And it can be regarded as being an IT based thing, but like, I think it's, we, we were talking before and it's, it's like really everyone should be at least be aware of what we're doing here. What, what was the equation that you, you showed? Yes. Me? I think this is a, a big misconception that AI is not an IT phenomenon. 
It's not something for IT. It's not something for technical people. AI is an everybody thing. It's a global phenomenon. It's a global challenge. It needs to be in the hands of the business leaders, the commercial people driving it. The IT people, the IT team are going to support uh, delivering the tools to do that. And I think a good way to think of this is a, a really simple equation. AI capability equals people times AI tools times data. Now, if any of those in the equation is zero, then you have no AI capability. So you might have the best AI tools in the world. You might have some amazing data set up. But if you've got nobody to use it, you've got no capability. If you've got people who don't know what it is, have no AI literacy, they don't understand how to prompt it, they don't understand the difference between generative versus retrieval AI, you've got a zero. Um, if you've got people who are AI literate uh, and they're there and they're quite talented, but they don't have a purpose, they don't have an objective that they're trying to do, they're just wandering aimlessly, you also have a zero capability. So that sort of people area is a function of you know, the individual, the talent, times their AI literacy, times their purpose of, of what they're bringing to the AI. And that bit of the equation is massively overlooked. Uh, so many organizations are focusing on the tools, building things in, the technology and the data, and it's all over here. And I see so many AI projects getting lost uh, and getting confused because the people leading the organization, the commercial people, the people selling it, the people talking to the clients, the users, the customers, uh, the customers don't know what it is, don't understand how to use it, don't know where it is to go. And that, that I think, is the place to start. Start with the people, start with playing, start with air literacy, worry about how to use it, where to go later, get that AI, the people bit up from zero, get them AI literate, get it up to a one or a two, and then as you start bringing the tools into play and the data into play, you'll start to find you have a capability to really apply it. Now you can apply that equation to an individual, you can apply it to an organization, business, university, you could apply it to a country. You know, you can, you can scale that up however it fits. People times AI tools times data. All three important. People keep forgetting, people keep forgetting the people. Funny, very funny that. And the strange thing I have to say, having worked with AI now with so many people uh, and so many different organizations uh, over you know, the year and a half I've been on this, we've been on this kind of whirlwind journey is, what I've learned is it's nothing to do with technology. The technology is actually really easy. You just pretty much talk to it and it does stuff for you. Okay, the cutting edge training of some of the things is a bit harder, but it's not really that difficult. The challenge is the same challenge as it's been there in organizations for, for years. Really, AI is about people, education, and change. That's the essence of it. People, education, change. Start there, build up. I'm just going to quote Sam Altman, founder of OpenAI, for a moment. And this is Sam Altman co quoting somebody else, actually. But Sam Altman said, if you think you understand the impact of AI, you do not understand the impact of AI and have yet to be instructed further. Now, what he means by that, if at any point in time, you slash anybody thinks they're an AI expert or they know everything there is to know or they, can, they know what's going to happen in their industry, they are lying. AI is such a huge educational learning subject area that discoveries are going on continually every day. There's new things coming out. There's new features rolling, new, new models. Um, just yesterday, ChatGPT has launched into the API a way of uh, bringing out uh, JSON slash structured prompt responses, which is a very technical thing, but this, you know, this really helps a lot of the stuff that we've been suddenly talking about. This stuff's changing all the, all the time. If anyone who thinks they know what's going to happen or they understand it, that they're wrong. The way to lead this as an organization or a leader is to say, we don't really understand what it is, but we need to learn what it is. And me as a leader, I need to learn what it is. We, as a team, we need to learn what it is. Not quite sure how it's going to work out. We don't really know what the future will be. What can we control in uncertain terms like that? We can control 
what we do. We control how much we know about it. We control our air literacy. So who knows what's going to happen, but we can control learning about it, exploring it, building our air literacy, building that capability of the team and the people. And then whatever the future holds, knowing more about it, we're going to be in a better position. We're going to be able to pivot, we're going to be able to adapt. We'll see what does work, we see what won't work. And you know that I think is the is the place to start. People first, build the capability, train, lead the learning. It's okay to say we don't really know what it is, but we're going to learn and we're going to explore. Build in that learning to the organisations, and I think I think that's the strategy for moving forward in this field. Brilliant, but Rob, really appreciate it. I'd thoroughly recommend your courses. I think they're brilliant. You really convey it really well and articulately and in a practical way. And some of the practical things we did with you on that course, I've taken away and implemented. So I really appreciate your time today. And uh, yeah, let's see what happens with uh, the future of AI. Brilliant. Thanks very much for having me, Andy.